All right, so what we're looking at is the late 19th century in Little Bay, Newfoundland. This is a mining community, and my research is focusing mostly on the years between 1878 and about 1904. So in 1878, we get the mines starting. Um, it happens pretty much overnight. And then in 1903 and 1904, we get to back-to-back -back fires. As you know, my name is Ian Evans, and I study the history of Little Bay, Newfoundland. I've been asked by your instructor to introduce you to my research uh, as part of your branding project for your term. And in this presentation, I'd like to give you a general overview of my project on the history of Little Bay with particular attention to the difficulties in presenting um, this information in a traditional museum or heritage uh, setting in light of um, the shortage of uh, physical objects and uh, the fact that this is a forgotten or lost history. Um, so I address the reasons um, for the difficulties, um, for uh, the problem that I presented. Hopefully I can get you thinking about some of the ways that um, this might be solved or addressed. So uh, in this lecture I want you thinking about key historical figures. I mean, so I've picked a few. Um, I've tried to focus on uh, visiting or living residents or uh, that have uh, Wikipedia pages, people that be easy to find information about uh, with the Google search. Um, also, uh, I'm going to address historical objects, um, those that remain, um, where they are, who they're attached to, and in this I would include things like photographs guys, um, or photographs of objects. In, in light of that, I'd like you thinking about like the remains of history, um, the, what is left behind, um, and what can be found or, or reconstructed. So you got this town, right? Little Bay is this little coastal village today. It's got this hidden history that's not even known in uh, Little Bay, which is you know, what pulled my interest. So if you arrived here today, you'd find this small coastal village, right? It's population just over 100 people, but it once housed over 2,000, which you know doesn't sound like a really high number by today's standards, but if you're late 19th century Newfoundland, that number is going to make it one of the largest centers on the island, rather well-to-do, uh, and as I mentioned before, German-speaking upper class, which is kind of unusual um, for the area. So Little Bay, uh, during its peak at this time, is operating as a kind of unofficial capital for what's being called the Northern Mining Region of the Island, region, sorry. And so it's going to boast, it's going to be able to boast a fairly well, um, uh, well-educated, um, decent income, uh, posh uh, reputation. So you get this quaint, cozy uh, village that you look at today, you're not going to expect this history. Um, and really, you know, until I started digging into this, there was, really was nobody working on this history. So Little Bay founded um, <clears throat> in 1878, uh, destroyed by two back-to-back -back fires in 1903 and 1904. Um, if you look at um, early depictions, mostly in the writing of Howley. Uh, Howley is a cartographer that's gone out of mapping Newfoundland in 1919. Um, so he's on location prior to the creation of the town. So you're in the summer of 1878. And what he describes is um, a wilderness, right? There's uh, no human population whatsoever. And they return only you know, a few months later and find this kind of um, high functioning community with wharves and stores and things are already intact. Uh, these things have been moved over from Batscope by boat. Um, and as I stated, we had two back to back fires, 1903 and 1904. Now, the oral history would have that as um, a single event. Um, there's a large fire that goes across that section of the island um, in 1904. Um, so it's generally thought that that is the fire that destroys the town. Um, in my research, I found that there's actually a, a fire the previous summer in 1903, um, which takes out the main section of Little Bay, which is known as the Bite. It was a result of a, a kitchen fire that was started by the town priest. So the bite gets wiped out, and then it, you know a year later, basically the entire surrounding area gets taken out. And of course, no discussion about the history of Little Bay would be complete without addressing the town's founder. So the father of the community is a German baron, Baron Franz von Ellershausen. So he is one of the entry points of me getting really interested in this work. Um, so he's a German industrialist. He is uh, in Nova Scotia in the 1860s when there's a shipwreck uh, off the coast of some uh, German families who are immigrating to the United States. Uh, as they're his countrymen, he uh, builds for them a town. Uh, it is still there today, known as Ellershaus. I would consider it a sister community to a little bit. 
And then a few years later, the Baron has his own shipwreck off the coast of Newfoundland, arrives in Newfoundland, uh, discovers the fledgling mining industry that's starting to take off there, um, sets up a town called Betts Cove, which is the first big kind of mining hub before Little Bay is discovered. Uh, in 18, well, we'll say 1878 is the beginning of the town, but, you know, they're starting to uh, notice some copper in the area in 77. So we get this German uh, baron who's the founder. This is in contrast with a lot of Newfoundland. There's not a lot of German uh, history here. In the 1880s, the town gets a magistrate, which would be like the highest ranking government official in the town. Uh, his name is John Bennett Blandbert. Um, and his... Well, he himself uh, um, works quite uh, closely with the town's uh, police constable, Thomas Wells. Um, they're heavily involved in the temperance movement, the fight against alcohol. Um, Blandford's daughter is also of note, uh, Eliza. She becomes Eliza Stafford. Now she marries the town's first doctor. This doctor would have been appointed by the Baron. Um, Dr. Stafford goes on to um, have a pharmacy uh, business that extends across the Newf uh, from Newfoundland, uh, ointments and such that would be affiliated with the culture of the island itself. Um, so those products would have been sold in the town and probably could be located. I imagine some of those um, uh, containers and jars and stuff. I'm just guessing, but I imagine some of those could be found. Uh, Eliza herself is heavily involved in the town's theater culture. Um, and I think that would have been part of that kind of aristocracy, um, upper class um, um, culture that the town has associated with theater. Um, and yeah, and I have quite a few of their performances, songs that were sung, um, even um, locally written songs of some of the lyrics. All right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Little Bay's police. Primarily a gentleman by the name of Thomas Wells arrives in Little Bay on August 3rd of 1883 during the town's annual regatta. He wasn't there for that though. He wasn't there for fun. He was a staunch and imposing man with a sense of moral superiority. Little Bay was a mess and he was there to clean it up. He would have known coming in that the place was dangerous. He had a suddenly expanding mining town which had attracted a rich assortment of colorful characters beaten by the cold Atlantic rugged terrain which had been wilderness only five years before was newly established and still very much wild. Criminals operated without concern since the departure of the Germans and there was little police presence prior to the sergeant's arrival. So for the week leading up to Wells showing up, the closest officer was in Twillingate, which is a ways away. You have raids and robberies and an ever-threatening uh, presence of drunkards who are openly uh, brawling in the streets. So you have crime running rampant. So at this time, Little Bay is overseen by a magistrate. So this is going to be like government authority that's come in to uh, replace uh, the German baron. So Magistrate uh, Blandford is the first magistrate. Him and Sergeant Wells, uh, they have a friendship right off. Uh, the two of them, they're both uh, on the side of temperance, right? Uh, total abstinence against alcohol. So they immediately go to work. They put up notices for the Supreme Court, report on theft, issue a summons in a case of bastardry. And within a, like a week, this is getting noticed by the newspapers and the duo are like uh, local folk heroes. They're breaking up street fights and making many arrests. So I, as I mentioned, the town has this active temperance movement. So the temperance meetings are being held in the public hall. So that's also where you have these public debates, which Right around the time that Wells arrives, you're still, as I mentioned before, you have this uh, conflict between these two different uh, upper class groups, like a cultural divide. And that's largely on the issue of total abstinence versus moderate drinking, right? Because you have this, uh, like owners of businesses who sell alcohol and their supporters on the side of moderate drinking that are trying to push back against this total uh, ban on alcohol and the temperance movements. Okay, so at the time, you have the public hall for temperance meetings, but it's also ha housing these intellectual debates, right, from different um, like members of the different groups. There'd be other topics, but this topic was popular. Wells comes in and starts pushing really hard against all recreational drinking. He takes a really hard stance. So initially, you're seeing debates against him from some of the other like intellectuals from the other camp, but not very long. I, I can't prove it, but it looks to me like there's pressure being applied off, like off screen, uh, outside of the, the media coverage to get these people 
to back off and not take that position publicly. So the town has several establishments for selling alcohol at this time. You have the Little Bay Hotel and John Lamb's Skittle Alley, also known as Lamb's Corner, as the two most prominent. So these legal sellers immediately come under suspicion of also selling it illegally. And the police can't go after them directly, so they start cracking down and making arrests of their clientele for loitering, being drunk outside, disorderly, and then the business owners themselves for like small infractions on like window size and display, right, so little things. So they're getting hit with a lot of red tape. Um, at the same time, right, temperance pressure, uh, which is attracting the church leadership. Uh, you're seeing public debate on the issue kind of getting a little quieter. So it doesn't take long before uh, the Wells and his uh, posse basically take aim at the proprietors themselves. So as I said, first for these minor infractions, but it doesn't stop there. So in December of 1886, there's a raid on the Skittle Alley, right? This is John Lamb's establishment. It's like a 19th century arcade. It has different uh, uh, indoor games, right? Uh, with a shooting gallery, billiards, a couple of other things. All right. So a month later, after this raid on the Skittle Alley, John Lamb gives a public testimonial at a temperance meeting in support of banning liquor licenses. Right? So he gets raided by the cops and then completely changes his position to be against alcohol. A month after that, his Skittle Alley gets torched in an arson attack, of which there are a series related to uh, this, uh, the two sides of this debate. So... You know, again, can't prove it, but looks suspicious to me that like the they're using the law right on one side of a, a social movement and at the same time overlooking uh, the breaking of the law that are uh, against people on the other side of, of that of that debate. So the temperance movement movement in Little Bay is largely successful. You have the local bars closing up shop in 1887. So now that's the end of legal alcohol sale. Now you have the illegal sale of alcohol, which is another matter. Now here the issue are Sheban houses, which are kind of like uh, bars that people have inside their houses illegally, basically. And they're supported by bootlegging operations, right? Which are also hosted by these, uh, like the network of people's homes and like um, illegal nighttime shipping. Um, <clears throat> I know one case where they, they hid the rum inside uh, larger barrels of salt. So the most notorious of these kind of bootlegger operations, like Sheevan houses, are a couple called the McLeans. We get Michael and Mary McLean. So there's husband and wife team. They have this endlessly, like seemingly endless set of tricks for evading capture. Like everybody knows they're doing it, but they're slick, right? And they're getting away with it. So they end up proving themselves to be rather uh, difficult antagonist for the sergeant and his police force. So in order to deal with this, with the, the final, like the final showdown, the police engage in this undercover operation around the bay in the fall of 1887. So this is the ruse that finally nets Little Bay's most infamous bootleggers. So this showdown requires a sting operation because they can't get the McLeans directly. Um, there's people in the police force feeding them information and they're pretty wily. So in order to do this, the police don civilian clothes and then using putty, Wells makes himself a fake nose, shaves off his beard, dyes his hair black, and then they go out at night in a boat, and then they take the boat to the residence of the McLeans, pretending to be like, visiting from out of town. Like, their costumes work, they get inside, and then they're able to bust them because it catches them all in the act of drinking, so he, he's able to, they're able to finally bust the McLeans. And I, there's a couple of direct quotes in the newspaper, which is neat because you're, you're not seeing this a lot, so, but it gives a lot of character. So Mary McLean, and she's quoted yelling, I am damned if you will get the jar, Wells, I'll die first. And then she curses him further at court and says, Oh, Wells, you are a hard man. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air nest, but you have not a friend anywhere. Your name is a terror to me. So long may it continue to terror the evildoer. And this task, this undercover operation, earns his police force the rather cool nickname of the Invincibles. So during uh, Sergeant Thomas Wells' time in office, he sees a bunch of uh, robberies, jail breaks, there's no shortage of violence. He's mindful, he catches a lot of people, a lot of people answer for crimes. Also, I'm suspicious that they weren't uh, fighting this uh, totally above the table. 
Nevertheless, his jail is rarely empty, and uh, when he eventually retires from policing, he stays in Little Bay, goes on to become the town's second magistrate, so a you know, pivotal character to the history of the town. And there's a portrait of him that still hangs today in the town's office in Little Bay, one of the few artifacts that's still around. Uh, and if you'd like to experience the day-to-day -day life of the town from the sergeant's perspective, you are in luck. Uh, it's one of the, or probably the only other person doing research on the history of Little Bay, aside from myself, is a man named Doyle Wells, who's become a good friend of mine. Uh, Doyle has his great-grandfather's, uh, the sergeant's, uh, police journals, which he has uh, published in a book called uh, All Quiet. And it's, if you, I mean, if you haven't seen it, it's just a terrific, um, like on the ground life in the culture, right? Just, you're really able to get into it. And yeah, it's a great read and I definitely recommend it. So next I want to tell you about a local resident who lived in Little Bay in the 1890s by the name of Thomas David Dobbin, also known as Davy or Do uh, Dobbin the Diver or Davy the Diver. So he's born in St. Mary's, 1817, works as a salvage diver at a time when diving required, you know, one of those large metal helmets, somebody's pumping the air in, right? there's no cold control in the icy Atlantic, you know, they're coming out purple when they're doing this. So he's credited with the recovery of thousands of human remains, uh, materials from shipwrecks, and this is down in the you know, deep, dark depths of the ocean, pulling out like, body after body. Uh, investigates crimes, is claimed, is claimed that he solved a murder at one point. So he enters the story of Little Bay after he's retired from diving, but he would be like a recognized uh, figure from his media coverage. So he's working there as a miner from 1882 to 1893. So um, he leaves Little Bay for St. John's following the death of his wife. Now you can find several accounts of his life. Um, perhaps most notably in Felix Perry's book In Deep Water in 2006. But in terms of like establishing like trails or sites or something for heritage, there's a, a swimming pond, um, like a larger body of water on the way into um, the, the highway that goes into Little Bay, basically off the main highway. Though this pond, which is currently named Davis Pond, but the name changed in my lifetime. Like when I was a child, it was called Davies Pond. And I'm, I think that the name change might be from a typo on, on Google Maps. I think whoever ended up with it just didn't know the local name. Now, in my own research, my earliest reference to Davies Pond comes from 1886, which lines up with the timeline that the diver Dobbin was living in the area. So again, can't prove it, but I suspect it's named for, and probably he lived nearby there, right? The Davies Pond for where Davy lived. So I think you know, that could be a, an interesting point for, uh, you know, if nothing else, putting up a, a sign. What I think is one of the more significant events to note for Little Bay's history is so the Duke of York, who goes on to be King George, is Prince George in 1881 when he, visits Little Bay, sort of. So I found this in um, the police journal. It just references the fact that the king is there right, in the harbor. There's no media coverage or anything on it, but I was curious about it. So I reached out to the, uh, the royal family. I mean, you know, not like I called the queen, but they have archivists you can get in contact with. And they gave me access to some of the, the diaries that were kept during the time to overlap with this visit. So it appears that you get Prince George on the, I think it's the HMS Canada, and another ship, uh, a likewise British ship. And the two ships are basically, they're in the area, so they meet up in the bay at Little Bay. And uh, now, while George does not come into the town, they, they host a party for the, the, the officers, basically from each, from both of the boats on one of the boats. So they have a little party in the bay, um, which is interesting. and. Again, like uh, so the HMS Canada, which is another huge, interesting ship. I have a picture of it, so this is a Comas class screw Corvette. Again, if you look on the Facebook page for my research, you'll find uh, any of the boats that have been, I can put in the town that I have names for that I've been able to find pictures of. I have a collection of them there. Um, I think that could be an interesting thing as some kind of a, a collage or like a pictorial tour. Um, yeah, I just, the boats are interesting. Also, you, know, you can redirect people to other places that the boats were. You can, some of the, I mean, I have shipping records and I have some uh, passenger lists for some of these ships. It could just, again, just could be interesting. Um, 
talking about there's another tie in with Prince George. So when he's um, um, when he becomes king, he has a tour of Little Bay, or sorry, a tour of Newfoundland. And while he doesn't come to Little Bay, the last of the copper that comes out of the mine is made into a, a, a shield. And this shield, which is mounted with a caribou head, is presented to the Duke of York in 1902. Now, this image I have here is I found on the Rooms website, and it's, it was presented to the Duke around the same time. I can't say for certain that it is the same shield, but again, I think it has a pretty good chance that it is. So we get multiple things that kind of tie into the royal family, which is, I think, super interesting. All right, so the next person I want to tell you about is Admiral Sir William Kennedy. So Admiral Kennedy at that time would have been at the rank of captain. Uh, so he's the commander of the British fleet in uh, the northern waters. Because we got to remember, like, not Little Bay itself, but not far from Little Bay, the northern coastline of Newfoundland at this time was uh, still owned by France. Right, so you have French, uh, I have a showdown at one point between mine captain uh, uh, John Stewart with a, a French battleship. So, you know, there's a French presence there as these mines are expanding. The English, of course, keep a fleet there. The leader of the English fleet is William Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy visits Little Bay, at, at least I know him to have visited in 1881 uh, on his uh, flagship, the HMS Druitt. So from 1879 to 1891, he's the senior officer assigned to Newfoundland Coast to guard against the French fleet as the northern coastline you know, is controlled by France until 1904. So the northern mining region, which again, headed by Little Bay unofficially, is dangerously close to this French territory. So there's you know potential of uh, of run-ins as I mentioned right Stewart's run-in with uh, a French battleship. So again, so HMS Druitt uh, with Kennedy on board visits in 1881. So this is following a major fire in the area. Again, fire is a prevalent and ongoing theme. And then he assigns his men to assist the miners in their recovery efforts, which is then documented in uh, some of Kennedy's later publications. But he makes an interesting note about how the miners would bury their belongings to protect them from fire damage and then return to them later. So these men would see the fire coming, right? They would take their valuables, dig a hole, put them in, and then they would take their boats, because most families had boats, and then take their boat, put the boat out in the water, wait till the fire ran through, and then go back and dig up you know, their valuables and start over again. Uh, so you know, who else but a miner basically would think to uh, hide their valuables underground in a fire, which is an interesting note from Kennedy. Uh, he also uh, takes the oldest man in the town, without, I don't have a name for him, there's no name, but he takes him drinking on his boat, and the gentleman starts telling these stories about, like, well, when I was here in the beginning, we caught the largest stag ever, and the size of the antlers on this, you know, uh, mythical beast continued to grow throughout the conversation. Just another little, uh, cute little quotable couple of lines. Again, it's, it's interesting because you don't get a whole lot of... Um, like words directly from people's mouths, especially if they're not uh, higher class people. So it's, again, just a neat little thing. Next, I'm going to talk about Lorena Sheldon. So this is an American author. Uh, she's a suff suffragette, so an activist fighting for like, this is feminism, basically in the era, feminism in the 18, 1880s, 1890s. She's an American. So she visits Little Bay in 1890, and I, I, she, it's in a publication. There are drawings that are taken during the visit. Again, aside from the fact that she was there, I don't have a lot on the, the event. It's not documented anywhere else that I've been able to find. What's interesting to note for me is that Jesse Oman, so Jesse Oman would have been a popular Newfoundland suffragette feminist fighting for women's rights in Newfoundland in the 1880s. Um, so, and she's interesting in a couple of ways. For one, she's like a, she's an editor of her own publication. She's attached to the temperance movement. Um, and she's in this kind of public showdown with her brother, who's a politician, right? Like publicly uh, debating uh, women's rights, women, should women have the right to vote? So Jesse Ullman is becoming a bigger figure in like, uh, if you're looking at like women's studies in Newfoundland today, you'd probably know it. I haven't been able to find a picture of her. Now there is some uh, documentation of her visit and so far as I can tell, it's it's there's not much or there's no hostility really in any of the media publications, and I'm not saying that there wasn't like hostility against feminism on the ground. I don't have anything to refute that, 
but it's just interesting because this temperance movement is attached to literacy, right? So this female empowerment through education is taking place in the church. It's also pushing right for uh, larger, higher literacy, literacy rates and getting rid of alcohol. So what you're seeing is these things kind of get tangled together. Um, again, we're talking about this kind of cultural divide. And then there's a, there's a point later in time where Little Bay brags, I think it's in the late 1890s, where there's a point where they're bragging about how now they can say that every house in town has a bookshelf, right? So this is a point of pride. So I would say that this literacy, literacy movement was largely successful. Um, yeah, and again, like I can't tie these two women together, but they're oddly, well, they're quite similar and they're, they miss each other by one year. So I'm just I'm suspicious. So there might be more to that than uh, what I've been able to uncover. So speaking of near misses, there's a gentleman named Gustav Kolb. Um, I'm quite proud of myself for being able to track down this event at all. It was it was in a um, a boys adventure magazine in the states. Um, so it's an American magazine aimed at young boys, and this Gustav Kolb guy was like an adventurer. Right? So he's traveling to these you know distant and different places, of which like northern Newfoundland mining community would be to the colonial world, you know to you know see how the people live, like this kind of uh, grand adventure. Today, so Kolb is one of these again characters that you can find a Wikipedia uh, article for, but he's remembered mostly today uh, for his study on music, as he's a, um, a recognized opera critic. However, in 1893, you know, he's visiting town as an adventurer. So he's his traveling companion, who's himself um, somebody of note, is an artist by the name of Milton Burns. Um, and again, you can find Burns' art online. And Burns does these sketches in the writing uh, while they're visiting Little Bay uh, to go along with Gustav Kolb's writing. So there are two sketches. One is of a, a dog, a dog slide story with uh, wind sails which I just find neat because I, I, you know, I didn't know, I had never heard anybody else say that they used wind sails um, to uh, aid in the, the dog sledding, but it, it makes sense, right? If you are on like an uh, open uh, ocean while it's frozen, you have a sled of dogs and there's wind that you could you know, make that go more efficiently with the wind sail. And these are people who you know, obviously spend a lot of time on the water using wind power, but I had never seen it before. And the other uh, image that he had drawn there was of a church belfry. Now, I find this interesting as well, mostly while well, I've done a whole lot of work on the belfry and the attached bell. I've got a, an article I'm pretty proud of on the blog about it. <coughs> so the belfry um, has a bell in it, and the bell is called St. Patrick. It's named for the day that it was created, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it's created by a blacksmith. And that took me quite a bit to figure out the blacksmith. So it's one of the few items to survive the 1903 and 1904 fires. And it also remains in the area. Um, it pictures of it. Uh, and should also be noted that Kolb, so this is another where I think there's an interesting overlap because Kolb himself was also an accomplished diver. And it's not like divers were super common at that time. Um, he went on to write a, a book about um, diving uh, at that time, which has, some, again, some great drawings in it. And now he, he just misses uh, Diver Dobbin, but I, I find it you know, difficult to think that this a man who's coming to write about the town who is a diver, he wouldn't hear about the local legend who just left who was a diver. So again, it would have been nice to actually make that connection. Um, uh, I can't. I can tell you is that Cobb goes on to spend the rest of his life traveling with a Newfoundland dog, which would seem to indicate that uh, his visit had a lasting impression. Now, getting into uh, World War I military history as it relates to uh, Little Bay, there are a number of uh, vets, um, and the documents are kept, or a lot of the documents for those um, officers are housed at the rooms in St. John's. A lot of it can be accessed online. Uh, Little Bay can claim um, through John Croche the uh, first Victoria Cross to a Newfoundlander. And but the, probably the biggest like war hero, World War I era, uh, attached to the town is a gentleman who went by the nickname Mayo Lind. So, as I mentioned, like I spent my childhood summers in Little Bay, 
And there's a little pond down towards the bike called Lind's Pond, named after the Lind family. So they were a family that were in town from the mid 1880s until the early 1940s. So I think that this is this pond has a major uh, significance. It could probably be marked. So again, like even if you're in Newfoundland, you probably already know the name Mayo Lind. Like especially if you have any interest in military history, uh, it's a nickname given to a man named Francis or Frank Thomas Lind. So his family moved to Little Bay when he was seven years old. Uh, his father took a job as the paymaster for the mine, again under the Baron, uh, after becoming dissatisfied uh, with his income as an educator. So they move around a lot, but they end up in Betts Cove before settling in Little Bay in 1885. So their house would have been located just above the pond. Uh, and again, there are a couple of images of their home. So again, as I mentioned, there's an educated family um, and you see the, the emphasis in their children on their education. Um, so this, I think, plays a big part in what happens next. So you get um, Frank becomes kind of an unofficial wartime correspondent. So uh, he's writing about these flying machines, mustard gas, and how the men sang the songs of James Murphy. The song of the apples was their favorite. They sang it with the other Newfoundlanders in the trenches. Remember World War One trench warfare, mustard gas. Like so, in the letters, that these and the military documents. I've, you know, I've been able to put a nice bit together. You see, you know, the men suffering from frostbite, trench foot, influenza, gonorrhea, bullet wounds, grief, this endless threat of death. And he's writing about the German prisoners and their Australian allies. And through it all, his letters have this kind of cheerful nature, very accommodating demeanor. So a friend of his who once mentioned that while suffering from fever, Lind offered to cover his shift back to back at risk of sniper fire. So you know, the man has a legend of being a great gentleman. So he starts writing these letters home from France and uh, Gallipoli. They're published in the, the Daily News, which is a newspaper in Newfoundland. And they document the early days of the war from the front line. So these become a window into the front line for Newfoundlanders. Right? So these, as these letters get published, they attract a lot of attention. A lot of people have you know, their sons and brothers and husbands are over there fighting. So they're getting their window into what's going on through these letters from Mayo Lind. Now he earns this nickname, Mayo. So Mayo is a brand of tobacco that's being used among the troops. So he's complaining in one of these letters that they don't have enough tobacco. It ignites this thing called the Mayo Lind Fund, spreads across the island. So Newfoundlanders start raising money for tobacco and other supplies to be sent to the troops. First arrival of tobacco, uh, Mayo brand tobacco earns him his famed nickname among his friends and comrades. So he dies at Beaumont Hamel in uh, 1916 on July 1st. I mean, again, if you know anything about Newfoundland history, the Battle of Beaumont Hamel is a big deal. So it's a full year before his body's recovered. And during that time, uh, his death is learned by his family uh, through the newspapers, right? So they, don't, they, they get the information when everybody else does. Uh, again, in his military files, there's a lot of letters back and forth as they try to figure out if he's a, a, a prisoner of war or not. So Frank Lind is, becomes this popular figure, right? And his death is felt right across Newfoundland. Like people are hurting. He's almost like a celebrity status. So three years after he's killed, his letters are published in a book and sold in local shops. And the proceeds of those sales are used for a memorial. So uh, Frank's mother, Carolyn Lind, requests that it takes the form of a church lectern. So the Mayo Lynn Memorial uh, and this event, right, this thing gets covered. And I, get, I have reference to this in a half dozen different newspapers and m multiple times in each newspaper. It's quite a lot of, uh, uh, quite a few sources. And so I was able to put together that it was manufactured by this firm, J.P. Whippet & Co. in London and Exeter. I found the shipping, figured out that it was in the display in St. John's at Aaron Sons Dried Goods Department. And then later there's a brass tablet that gets, arrives later to be attached then the whole thing gets repackaged and shipped to Little Bay and donated to the Church of England in Little Bay, uh, which is called St. Luke's. So the lectern is said to be handsome and a credit to Exeter's craftsmanship. The tablet, which follows, um, carries the regimental badge and the inscription on the tablet reads, uh, to the glory of God and the memory of Private Francis T. Lind, born of Betsco, March 9th, 1879, um, <coughs> who with many of his gallant comrades, fell gloriously in action at Beaumont Hamel in France on July 1st, 1916. Their name liveth forevermore. So the church plays a first hymn on the new organ. There's a memorial service which marks its unveiling July 3rd, 1921. And as I mentioned before, the policeman's diary, and it describes his well-attended service and um, 
<clears throat> Reverend Bull officiating the memorial service after which you know, gives an interesting, impressive address on the valiant ones who fell for the cause of right and liberty. Now, when I, I, dis, I uh, wrote an article about all of this research last uh, Remembrance Day, which then uh, you know, led me to try to track down this lectern. So I have to toot my own horn here, who really affected my research a little bit, but I was able to find the last church that it was in in Springdale, and then get in contact with representatives of that church. Um, and then myself and an Anglican researcher were able to track down the, uh, the current location. And then the family who had it, like they had a sentimental attachment to it from it being in a church that they went to, but like not this, you know, the, the huge significance of this history that I, I'd kind of uh, unveiled. So then it was uh, agreed to be donated to the Regimental Museum in St. John's, where it's currently on display. Um, again, based around my research, just uh, proud of myself for that one. Um, yeah, so a culturally significant artifact gets recovered and is on display. And again, like here, this is a, another visible object. Again, you can see images of this that have been submitted uh, to me. But again, really, as I said, there are not a lot of uh, objects, not a lot of uh, material culture that remains. And this, of course, is another example of one that wouldn't, um, I, you know, obviously you couldn't move it. You could have images to display of it. But again, like, you know, his letters are published. There's a book that you could easily sell in a shop. Uh, and I think that if you connect things like, um, you know, his history to some of these other locations, such as, you know, the military museum in St. John's, you know, it would be easy enough to have a tourist visit one site and then, you know, get suggested the other. Again, just my thinking. And just to touch briefly on like what I can tell you about the culture of the town, if you were to do some kind of like a reconstruction or anything like that, um, Reverend Harvey's writing on Betts Cove, which I would take to be pretty close, um, depict, especially under the German um, oversight, like a very tidy, um, industrious, uh, uh, alcohol-free, culturally constructed, almost garden state feel. You know, people are and they're not spitting and they're being polite, and but there's very constructed culture from the, the German baron. Uh, on top of that, everyone's prospecting and expecting to get the next big copper find, right? So uh, he refers to it as the copper fever. He said uh, even their dreams would must be yellow. And he says like everyone's walking around with a, a piece of ore in their pocket and they're, everyone's excited to tell you where they think the next big find is going to be. So it's not just that they're mining, it's a culture of mining and it's expected to boom and explode. Like that's what's on everybody's mind. So one of the more uh, interesting aspects of its history is its German uh, origin. So um, the historical new claims not generally uh, thought of as um, German and the higher culture or the high class in the uh, 19th century little bit would have been German speaking. A particular note in the town, I should mention, it's, uh, it had this weekly brass band that would march to a public bazaar. Um, it had a public hall, which was known for community theater, uh, public debate, uh, scientific lectures, um, a few different sorts of what you would consider, I guess, a kind of a higher highbrow culture. Um, it had a reading room, which is um, sort of like a library, like a book lending service. Um, you have these gentlemen in the town sitting around smoking their cigars, and uh, they have um, monthly like um, publications that they're basically subscribed to. Um, and in mail service, it's a little different than it would be today, so it's not as uh, consistent in its arrival. So, so as new, uh, you know, these high-class gentlemen arrive to the town, they'll often bring their own literature or uh, works with them. The town had a competitive cricket team connected to a bonnet hop, which is the sort of dance it would have after their ho hosting uh, rival teams. The base cricket team was known as the Pioneers. Um, there was also um, major public outdoor events, in particular would be the Queen's Jubilee, which saw a variety of outdoor activities, including um, climbing a greased pole, um, cricket again. Um, there's also uh, a Skittle Alley, and I think the Skittle Alley is one of the more interesting aspects of the town. So Skittles is a precursor to bowling. Um, in which you would throw a block of cheese or a bean bag at a set of pins in an attempt to knock them over. Now, the Skittle Alley um, is kind of, I think of it like a 19th century arcade, um, kind of cross, but it, it crossed with a bar. So it's got um, kind of a seedy, it's a little bit rough around the edges. You've got a Skittle Alley, as I said, it's kind of like bowling. And you would also have an indoor shooting uh, gallery, billiards, right, other um, 
indoor uh, activities. And I think this is, in, in my mind, one of the more interesting ways you can kind of take doing modern heritage um, in the town. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, it's kind of technologically advanced. And again, technologically advanced for the late 19th century, but they see themselves right at the cutting edge of science at the edge of the world. It has uh, one of the most advanced industrial warfages in the world, able to host several steamships simultaneously. There's a telegraph office, which is, you know, this is high tech stuff, right? Instant communication. Um, and they would have magic lantern shows, which is, um, a lot of them see colored something similar to like a photograph essentially so using a projection uh, with tricks of light so you could you know go to a presentation and see you know diff pictures of different places or cities around the world kind of projected onto a wall uh, and then after well, I was talking about the bonnet hops before after which they would have skyrockets uh, skyrockets are uh, essentially um, fireworks displays so I'm just gonna I kind of give you an idea of what life, uh, the livelier aspects of the town's life were like. And then, as I mentioned before, there's several significant fires. There's also quite a bit of arson. Of course, everything's made out of wood. Um, I would pay particular attention to the fires of 1881, um, as depicted by Admiral Kennedy in his writings. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the destructive fires in 1903 and 1904. Uh, the oral history has those as two fires, um, or sorry, uh, the oral history has those as one fire. Um, so there's a major fire that kind of grows across that part of the island and destroys like um, significant uh, parts uh, in 1904. And the oral history has it as if there was one event, right? But uh, if you uh, dig a little deeper, you'll find that Little Bay proper, like the bite area of Little Bay was, um, uh, destroyed by fire uh, the summer before uh, the rest of the area uh, as a result of a cooking accident um, uh, committed or accidentally committed I should say by the town's priest uh, Reverend Lynch or Father Lynch. Uh, as I keep saying there's not a lot of material culture that you can locate uh, however again it's cool the bell is still there there's a drawing by a like a famous artist of the belfry it was housed on but the black iron eye bolts that held those lines for that belfry are, are one of the few things that still exist. So in terms of like a walking trail or an information plaque, like it's just up over the hill in the bite and they're just cool because like, you have the, the other object is there and you have quite a bit of the history on it. So I think it's kind of a neat little tie-in. Now on the mine site itself, again, not a lot. You can find a couple of the, uh, a further couple of the black iron eye bolts. Um, but there is the remains of a kiln, which is one of the very few uh, existing historical material cultural kind of artifacts. I should also note that in that area, there's a buried crusher uh, with the dates on it, like made in England in 18, I think it's 86. I have quite a bit of information on that crusher and those operations. And I, I don't think it's you know very deeply buried. So um, I believe the land is currently um, or the, the, the claim I think is currently owned by Vulcan Mineral uh, or in St. John's. Um, and I you know, don't know how much difficulty it would be to request you know, the ability to dig that uh, crusher up as a pretty neat artifact. I'll take you through a few other objects. This is a Masonic lock, which was dug up uh, by my father actually in the garden by his cabin, which was in the area. Uh, this is an ink well, which was found uh, near one of the smaller bodies of water during a drought. Um, this is an example of a fire brick. This image is from the internet, but you can find some of these fire bricks around the town. Like people still have them um, built into their houses or uh, built for fire pits in their backyard and such. So one shouldn't be too difficult to locate. Um, and again, the uh, the history of those fire bricks itself is still online um, for the company that makes them. Uh, also, I have some ads that were in the the newspaper when the mine sold them off in the 1890s. And I just like to close out with a couple of pictures. Again, I, any pictures of the town from this time that I have are in a collection on the Facebook page for the research. But I've been able to identify a few of these photographers. And some of these uh, images are uh, incredibly uh, detailed. Uh, the originals for uh, one of them in particular, I think is Simon Parsons' work, is on the MUN website. And like you can blow that up to the size of the side of a house and still zoom in and get more detail. 
So I think that could be turned into like a pretty massive uh, billboard or something if you wanted to. But mentioning a few of the named uh, photographers, you have Edward Holloway, who would have had his own studio in uh, St. John's. He would be known today if you were into photography in, in New Glen, New Glen history. Visits the Little Bay in 1900. Uh, Simon Parsons, who I just mentioned, his pictures are superb. Uh, visits Little Bay in 1884. Again, like a, a locally recognized name if you, you know, were into the history of New Glen photography. Uh, and finally, I mentioned a gentleman named Otis Boyden. Boyden is interesting. So um, I, I, I've designed my own methodology. Uh, well, I, someone's probably done it before, but essentially what I've done, my background is sociology, so I combined like a so snowballing technique, which is you, you one subject and bring it to another subject and so on until you get to uh, like the subject that you're trying to make, you're trying to interview. Um, and I do, one of the things I do to, to get new material this way is I uh, first construct a genealogy right, of a family and then I'll trace it down to a living uh, descendant, make contact with that descendant, offer them information on their family and then sometimes they'll exchange material back to me. Otis Boyden was listed in Little Bay as a photographer in 1882 employed by the mine and then later seems to get ran out of town for not paying rent. But when I got in contact with uh, someone who did research on the family, I got a really interesting oral history where Otis Boyden and his brother were photographers. I believe they were to BC. And they had been hired or sent on a mission basically by Prime Minister John MacDonald to take pictures of each of the different provinces of Canada to show to people of the other provinces to give people a sense of the wholeness of the country. Remember, it's still a fairly new country and they call it so this is a, a photographic mission to try to create like a cultural identity when they get to Newfoundland's not yet part of Canada of course at this point and when they get to the ocean his brother turns back but Otis Boyden keeps going right so he's working in Little Bay for a number of years as a photographer now I'm not able to definitively identify his photography however I can kind of get the dates by figuring out which buildings and certain people, that I can get enough information comparing photographs to kind of narrowing the date. So the one I have depicted is um, from about the right time that he was there. Now, in talking again to that family researcher, there's a number of photographs in her collection of mine with these uh, uh, subjects basically facing the camera in the lower part of the frame. So you know potentially we have a style uh, technique that might be able to be used to identify some of his uh, photography. But again, like just a, a fascinating uh, kind of a family history uh, connected to, uh, you know, Prime Minister John MacDonald and the history of Canada and the history of photography. Right? So it's a, a lot there that could be super interesting. So again, like, and one of the main thing that we even have left really, as I said, right, are, are photographs or images. So, um, you know, what are some interesting or unique ways basically to go about displaying them. I think it'd be really cool to kind of uh, have a, the photographs lined up in such a way that you're looking towards the location of where they were taken, right? because I have enough information to identify in, uh, certain buildings and certain occupations and certain events that you could then overlap with those uh, locations. Um, so hopefully that helped. It was difficult deciding um, what to give you guys as I have an awful lot of material on this stuff. But uh, yeah, well, let me know your thoughts and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or want any uh, further material. And uh, thanks for listening.